At one time or another, all of us have faced situations in life when we've asked questions like, where is the Lord? What is he doing in this situation? You ever faced a situation like that? Who has it? Well, the answer to those questions are in the scripture, of course, but that's a big book. How do you know where to go to answer those kinds of questions? Well, there's any number of answers to that, any number of places you could go to. But in this series, through the topics in Proverbs, I'd like to restrict myself mainly today to answering that question from the book of Proverbs. Now, let me explain. Um, the book of Proverbs has a lot to say about relationships or kinds of people. And at the top of that list is the Lord himself and our relationship to him. There's so much said about that subject that I've divided that topic into two parts. Last time I spoke about the fear of the Lord, which is nothing more than knowing him, standing in awe of him, and yes, being afraid to step out of line, being afraid that you would not please him. And I talked about the benefits of knowing him. What I'd like to do today is look at some other things the scripture says about the Lord. Basically, I want to say three things. Now, as last time, I'm going to mention a whole number of different verses. But I want you to walk out the door with three basic thoughts in your pocket. So with that in mind, let me start. The first thing I want to say about the Lord from the book of Proverbs is that God is holy. Now we know that from numerous passages of scripture, but the book of Proverbs, I think, says that in a different kind of way. For example, the scripture is abundantly clear that God hates sin. As a matter of fact, there are a number of passages in Proverbs that talk about the abomination of the Lord. And in all of those cases, it's talking about sin that is an abomination to the Lord. The flip side of that is God is holy. And in his holiness, he hates sin. It is an abomination to him. The Hebrew word translated abomination means disgusting, means repugnant. I think abomination is one of those words we hear without getting the full impact of it. It is disgusting to him. Now, what is repugnant to the Lord? Well, for example, in Proverbs 11, verse 20, it says, Those who are of a perverse heart are an abomination to the Lord, but the blameless in their ways are his delight. So, the Lord hates sin. In this case, it is a perverse heart, one that is twisted, one that is crooked, one that is not thinking straight. That's the idea. So the Lord is disgusted with those who don't think straight, but he delights in those who not only think straight, but walk straight. But again, the point is he hates sin. And the flip side is he is holy. Or take another verse, Proverbs 15, 26. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant. The Hebrew word translated thoughts means thoughts, but it also means plans or purposes or devices. It's not just wicked actions, but wicked attitudes that are repugnant and disgusting to the Lord. Jesus said, out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts. And Solomon says, those are the things that are repugnant, disgusting to the Lord. Or take another proverb, 15 verse 9. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But he loves those 
who follow righteousness. And again, it's the same thing. The thoughts and the ways are an abomination to the Lord. Again, and this one might be a bit of a surprise, in Proverbs 15 verse 8 and again in 21 verse 27 it says, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. The sacrifice is an abomination? And as you know, in the Old Testament, they brought sacrifices to the tabernacle. And this verse is saying that when the wicked do that, the very spiritual, religious ritual of offering a sacrifice to the Lord is disgusting to him. In other words, the Lord is more concerned about the life of the person offering the sacrifice than the sacrifice itself. Ritual without reality is repugnant to the Lord. In other words, he's more interested in the way you live Monday to Saturday than he is the fact that you go to church on Sunday. In 28.9 it says, One who turns his ear from the hearing of the law, even his prayer is an abomination. So not just the act of giving a sacrifice, but the very prayer of those who do not listen to the Lord is disgusting to him. So when the disobedient pray, their prayer is disgusting to the Lord. If they do not hear him, he does not hear them. One more. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. This probably has reference to a judge. And it's saying he who justifies the wicked and that is declares them innocent or condemns the innocent is repugnant to the Lord. Now I've thrown a whole bunch of Proverbs at you. But the whole point is this. God hates sin. And the flip side of that is God is holy. But the way it's expressed in Proverbs is it's repugnant. It is disgusting. What's disgusting to you? I thought about this and uh, recalled something in my childhood. As you know, I grew up in Florida. Unless you've been there, what you might not know is Florida has roaches. They are disgusting. I remember as a kid, I hated roaches. But it was in California that I met the roach that was most disgusting. I was at a rather fine restaurant. Literally happened when a roach fell out of the ceiling right in my food. It was disgusting. I didn't even feel like eating. I never did eat again in that restaurant. But you, ever, you ever felt like that? What's disgusting to you? Well, that's how the Lord feels about our sin. My wife and Kathleen and some of us are on a text together and Kathleen texted us today, this week about California is now allowing abortion full term. And my wife responded, that's so disgusting, I can't even read about it. And that, that is the kind of thing. A roach in spaghetti is one thing. Abortion full term, or for that matter, unwarned warranted abortion at any term is repugnant. Yes. It's disgusting. Yes. And for that matter, so are the little sins we commit. But what you need to know from the book of Proverbs is God is holy. God hates sin. There's a second part of this holiness of God, and that is God judges now listen to a couple of Proverbs. This is rather interesting. Every way of man is right in his own eyes, 
but the Lord weighs the heart. That's Proverbs 21, verse 2. People justify themselves, but the Lord weighs the thoughts and the motives of the heart. Or as 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Another proverb that says something similar, deliver those who are drawn toward death and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. But if you say, surely we did not know this, but does not he who weighs the heart consider it? He who keeps your soul and does not know it, he will not render to each one according to his deeds. Those are a couple of verses in Proverbs 24, verses 11 and 12. And the point of those verses is this. Someone is being taken to their death. They're in danger of death. And someone else sees it and doesn't do anything to help them and says, I didn't know about it. Which is obviously wrong because they saw it happening. So this is not just ignorance, it's willful ignorance. Now, what the passage says is, God weighs the heart. He not only sees the action, he weighs the heart of a person doing such a thing. The point being, God judges. I'm saying God is holy. He hates sin, but he judges. That's part of his holiness. By the way, all judgment in the Bible is based on works. Remember the first time I heard that, it sort of shocked me, and then I looked around, and sure enough, it's true. God will give you heaven as a gift. In order for you to go to heaven, Jesus died, paid for your sin, arose from the dead, and all you have to do is trust him. The Bible says the gift of God is eternal life. Did you hear that? The gift of God is eternal life. That's Romans 6.23. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you are saved, and not, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Salvation, eternal life are gifts. But God judges. He judges us even after we trust Christ. That's called the judgment seat of Christ. And what he then judges is our works. That's clearly spelled out in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning at verse 11. And he's saying that he's going to take all of our works, he's going to test them by fire. And some are going to be burned up like wood, hay, and straw. And others are going to survive the fire. Gold, silver, precious stones. And then we're going to be rewarded. So God judges believers based on their works, not to get them to heaven, but to give them rewards. That verse in Ephesians 2 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's not by works that you're saved. It's by works that you are rewarded. But all judgment is by works. There's a second judgment in the Bible called the great white throne judgment. That's where believe, unbelievers stand. It's mentioned in Revelation chapter 20. And the point of that judgment, at that judgment, two books will be opened. One is the book of life. That's to see if you ever trusted Christ. The second book is your works. Unbelievers will be judged by their works. Not to determine whether or not they go to heaven. That's already determined. That's recorded in the book of life. But the book of their works determines the degree of their punishment. There are degrees in heaven and there are degrees in hell. That's only just. And the basis of both is works. So the forgiveness of sin, getting to heaven is all free. You trust Christ. He paid for your sin. You trust him. But after that, all judgment is based on works. And that's exactly what Proverbs teaches. There's another verse in Proverbs that talks about the fact 
that God not only judges sin, but he punishes sin. 17.5 says, He who mocks the poor reproaches his maker. He who is glad at calamity will not go unpunished. The point of that is that we're all made in the image of God. So, to mock uh, anybody is to reproach the one who made that person. And they will not go unpunished, according to Proverbs 17, verse 5. The whole book of Obadiah is an illustration of that, by the way. Edom rejoiced over the defeat of Jerusalem. And the whole point of Obadiah is God did not let Edom go unpunished. Proverbs 21.12 says, The righteous God wisely considers the house of the wicked, overthrowing the wicked for their wickedness. This verse really captures what I'm trying to say because it says the righteousness of God. And that's my point. God is holy. He's righteous. Amen. Therefore, he is disgusted with sin. He judges sin and he punishes sin. And this verse captures it all. So God carefully weighs the hearts and ways of the wicked and overthrows them for their wickedness. In other words, eventually justice will be done. If you struggle with some injustice that's been done to you, you need to remember this. Eventually, justice will happen because God judges works. They will be judged. One more. The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge, but he overthrows the words of the faithless, which is in Proverbs 22, verse 12. The word faithless here can mean deception. God makes vain the words of the deceitful. He overthrows and exposes deception. But again, the point is simply this. The first thing we need to know in this study of God in Proverbs is God is holy. But the way Proverbs expresses that is God detests sin. He judges sin. He punishes sin. The point being, God is holy. The second thing I want us to talk about concerning God in the book of Proverbs is that this holy, just, righteous God is in control of everything that happens. The book of Proverbs underscores this time and time again. Let me just mention some of the verses. For example, it says in Proverbs 29 verse 13, the poor man and the oppressor have this in common. The Lord gives light to the eyes. The Lord gives light to the eyes of both the poor and the oppressor of the poor. And the point is, God created them both. So poor people and those who oppress poor people are different, but they're like in this, that God created them both and they have a common origin. God's in control of all of this. He created it all. The Bible is very clear about that. We all have a common origin. God created us. God reigns on the just and the unjust. And there's a common departure. We all die. And in between, God knows what is happening. So it says in Proverbs 15, verse 3, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. And here it is again, this idea that God not only created the oppressor and the poor, but God sees everything, the evil and the good. So the Lord sees evil, whether it's in the, amongst the king in his palace or the servant uh, in the kitchen. God sees all of it. Proverbs 15, 11 says, Heaven and destruction are before the Lord. 
So how much more the hearts of the sons of men? The point being, if God knows what transpires in death, and afterwards, how much does he know, much more than does he know of what's going on in life? What is hidden from the eyes of people is open Amen. to the eyes of the Lord. So all these verses are saying God created us. He understands everything that's going on. But the ultimate point is that he's in control because he created and he knows what's happening. So, a number of Proverbs underscore that. Proverbs 16 verse 9 said, A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his path. Ah, people make plans, but the Lord determines whether or not those plans come to pass. Or as an old proverb says, Man proposes, but God disposes. You plan. God determines whether or not those plans will come to pass. There once was a man named Saul of Tarsus who planned to persecute Christians. And as he was traveling down the road to Damascus, he ended up becoming one of them. Mm -hmm. Onesimus decided he was going to run away. And he bumps into Paul. And then the will of God gets returned. People plan, but the Lord determines what actually happens. Then there's Proverbs 16.33. The lot is cast in the lap. But every decision is from the Lord. That's 16.33. Now in order to understand that. You have to know that they cast lots. That means they, they put names on a stone. And they put them in a jar. In this case the lap of an apron. And they picked out one. And uh, that determined what was going to be done. I think the problem with that is you look at it and say, hmm, does that mean we should cast lots to determine the will of God? Well, they did in the Old Testament. When they didn't know exactly what to do, they cast lots. But if you look at all those carefully, that was not, it was done in conjunction with the scripture. The last time casting lots is used in the Bible is in Acts chapter 1. Judas betrayed the Lord, and so they decided to replace the Lord. But if you read that passage carefully, they searched the scripture, and what they did was based on the scripture. They prayed, then they cast lots and chose Matthias to replace Judas. That's chapter 1. In chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes, and after that, never again. Do they cast lots in the Bible? So since the coming of the Holy Spirit, I would say this is not the thing to do. Rather, you search the scripture and seek the Lord to know what to do. But the point is, God is in control. And Proverbs 19, 21 says, There are many plans in the man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel will stand. So your plans may fail, but if the Lord determines it, it's going to happen. Matter of fact, Proverbs 20 verse 24 says, A man's steps are of the Lord. How then can a man understand his own way? Again, people choose. But just because they choose to do something does not mean it will come to pass. And the final analysis, God is in control. So Pharaoh's daughter decided to go down to the riverbed. Uh -huh. And lo and behold, she discovers a baby in a basket, and that turns out to be Moses. Now James chapter 4 teaches you should make plans, only you should say, we will do this or that if the Lord wills. Or take Proverbs 21.1. This one's always fascinated me. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wheresoever he wishes. Mm -hmm. Now this is based on the ancient practice of farmers who went to a stream or a river and they diverted the water into their crops. So they could turn the water where they wanted to by taking a branch off of a river 
And the idea is, just as a farmer does that, so does the Lord have the heart of the king in his hand. If you're ever up against an authority that you feel like you have no control, but it's all in their hand, just remember, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. That's a very comforting thing to know. The Bible is full of illustrations of that. God doesn't interfere with their will, but somehow he providentially moves and they make the decision he wanted them to make. So in the case of Joseph, God turned the heart of Pharaoh around and he was able to save the nation. In Daniel chapter 1, Daniel and his friends were in a position where they were going to have to violate the law of Moses and the Babylonian officer just happened to let them do something that would allow them not to disobey the law of Moses. When Nehemiah wanted to go back and build the wall around Jerusalem, he prayed to the God of heaven so that he might have favor with the king. So just know, the heart of the king or anyone in authority is in the hand of the Lord. Proverbs 21, 31 says, the horse is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance is from the Lord. Ah, military officers develop elaborate plans and strategies to ensure victory. But on the day of the battle, it is the Lord who gives the victory. Mm -hmm. The horse may be a legitimate means of defense, but never trust the horse. Trust the horse maker. Right. Psalm 20 verse 7 says, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Yes. Use means, but trust the Lord. Amen. Because the Lord is in control. That's the point. The Bible in Proverbs also teaches, and this is very important, God has a purpose. He's not arbitrarily controlling things. He has a purpose. Proverbs 16, 4 says, The Lord made all for himself, even the wicked for the day of doom. The little expression for himself is um, not the best translation. It means for its own end or purpose. So the Lord made all for his own purpose. Proverbs 21.30 says, There is no wisdom or understanding or counsel against the Lord. So the Lord has a purpose, and no human strategy can stop him. No human wisdom, insight, or counsel can outsmart the Lord. All right. I've told you two things you already believed. I hope. Right? What have I told you so far? Lord is... And the Lord is... In control. Oh, very good. I'm impressed. All right, I told you all that to get to this. Can you imagine something more awesome? God is holy. He hates sin. It's repugnant to him. It's disgusting to him. And he's in control. Not the king. Not you. He's in control. Did that scare you? No. Remember the fear of the Lord? Well, some of you are not convinced. Good. Because I have a third thing to say, and this is most important. This holy, mighty, powerful God who is in control of everything cares about you. Listen to Proverbs 15, 8. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Thank you, Lord. We talked about this a minute ago. 
ritual without reality is worthless. But the Lord delights to hear his children pray. Like a father or a mother that delights in the small child asking for something. So the Lord delights to hear his children say, I acknowledge that you are holy. I acknowledge that you're in control. Father, Father, the one who cares, Father, could you? And you simply ask because you know he cares. He provides peace because he cares. Proverbs 16, 7 says, When a man's way pleases the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. By the way, that doesn't mean that you no longer have an enemy. Um, you may still have the enemy, but the prince of peace makes the enemy to be at peace with you. I'd also like to add, I've mentioned this before, that we're talking about Proverbs, not law. And there's a difference. A proverb is a pithy little statement that may have an exception. A law is an absolute. If you want law, you go to Exodus chapter 20. You want Proverbs, you go to the book of Proverbs. These are true statements, but there could be an exception. God sometimes allows persecution. I'm going to talk about why he would do that in just a bit. But at this point, know that when you please the Lord, your enemies are pleased with you, even though they still may be your enemy. They are, I said, pleased with you. They're at peace with you. Stranton treated Lincoln with utter contempt. He called him, quote, low, a low, cunning clown, end of quote, and, quote, the original gorilla. He said there was no need to go to Africa to capture a gorilla when one was available in Springfield, Illinois. Lincoln never retaliated. Instead, he made Stratton his war minister, believing he was the best qualified for the office. Years later, when Lincoln was killed by an assassin's bullet, Stratton looked down on his rugged face and said tearfully, There lies the greatest ruler of men the world has ever seen. God gives you peace sometimes, even with your enemies. He protects. He cares. He delights to hear you come to him. He provides peace. And he protects. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Proverbs 18.10 By the way, it says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. You need to know that in the scripture, the name is often used of the person. So this is just another way of saying the person of the Lord is a strong tower. And so you run to him. Proverbs, I'm sorry, Psalm 9, 10 said, those who trust the Lord, uh, those who know his name will put their trust in him. Those who know his name, those who know him, trust him. Or Proverbs 18, 18, casting lots causes contention to cease and keeps the mighty apart. Again, the Lord provides peace and safety. Sometimes casting lots. I mentioned what that means a minute ago. Today we'd flip a coin or draw straws or draw numbers out of a hat. But the Lord gives the results. It's not chance. It's God's choice. So, whatever difficulties arise, this is the point. Let the Lord settle it. Now, I'm saying the Lord cares about you. He gives peace. He gives protection. But the one thing he's very interested in is to purify you. This is part of his care for you. Proverbs 17.3 says, The refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold. But the Lord tests the hearts. Now, 
This is really where I've been headed. This is very important. If you miss everything else I said, hear this. God wants to purify you and refine you. The imagery that's used here is refiners putting silver and gold in the furnace to separate the pure metal from the dross. The second line says the Lord uses trials to find, not to find people out, but to sort them out. In other words, to purify them. Were it not for the furnace, the dross would cleave inseparably to the metal. Until the metal has undergone the refining process, it's unfit for use. So, the Lord takes you through this process, which may be painful, but it's for a purpose. It is to purify you, to refine you. The process may be slow, but it's sure. And when it is finished, only the dross perishes and the pure metal is left behind. Hear me, and hear me well. On one hand, God is holy. Sin is disgusting. It's repugnant to him. He is high and holy. God is in control. But all of that means to those who are walking uprightly, those who walk in righteousness, he cares to protect them and to purify them and to refine them. And so we who know the Lord hightail it to him, so to speak. So it says, the refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. The Lord purifies the heart. All right, how are we doing? I said, I want you to remember three things. You got them? Uh Here's the sum. The Lord who is holy and the Lord who is in control has a purpose. He wants to give you peace. He wants to protect you. And he wants to purify you. In short, he wants to bless you. Now, I haven't had you turn to a passage of scripture yet, have I? (laughs) I left the best for last. I want you to open your Bible. If you don't have one, there's a one in the pew be, in before you. And I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. Part of the problem in doing a thematic study in the book of Proverbs is I have to cover so many Proverbs you can't possibly remember them all. And one of the ways I've tried to handle this is to um, summarize them into little points. But I have a passage I want you to look at that says everything I just said. It's 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Now, I want to... I wanna, talk about this passage of scripture for a second. You got it open? Some of you are taking notes. I want you to see three things in this passage. Number one, it says the mighty hand of God. God has a mighty hand. God is able. He's able to do what? Well, in Proverbs, the thing we've looked at today is he's able to give you peace He's able to protect you. He's able to purify you. And that is only the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more. The second thing I want you to notice is this. It says casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. Number one, he's mighty. Number two, he cares. Number three, he will exalt you in due time. So what should you do? Cast all your care upon him. This is what I want you to put in your pocket and walk out of here with today. The Lord is able and he cares. So go to him. 
Whatever the need, whatever the problem, go to him. Yes. Just remember, he's holy. Mm-hmm. Don't, don't play games with him. Don't think you can get away with sinning and him bless you. That's not going to happen. Am I coming through? Amen. You need to walk with him. Walk in his way. And then is when he blesses you. Because he cares. But he's still holy. But he's in control. He's mighty. And he cares. Now where are you going to go? You know, there's a way that seems right to a man, Solomon says. We encounter all kinds of problems and we figure, I got this one. I can handle this one. I have a bank account. I have a strategy. I got it all figured out. Oh, be careful. There's a way that seems right and the end thereof is death. In the 1930s, a wealthy Australian was dismayed at the signs that a global conflict was inevitable. He decided to find a safe place to live. He chose a tiny island in the Pacific, Guadalcanal. It turned out to be one of the worst places during World War II. Fear of an earthquake led a man to move from California to Ohio. Sometimes later, his new house was flattened by a tornado. A carpenter, afraid of being poor in his old age, worked almost day and night, lived very frugally, but he lost all of his money in bad investments and was wrong, was not wrong, to seek safety from bombings and natural disasters or poverty. Just remember, our safety is ultimately in the hand of the Lord. So cast all of your care upon him who cares. Father.